Hello and welcome to a new video featuring this IBM 5155. This is in fact the second IBM 5155 that I have because I had to swap in my first one for this gorgeous IBM 5154 EGA monitor. Something that I had been searching for for a very long time. So I was really psyched that I was able to make somebody happy with my IBM 5155 while at the same time receiving something that I had been searching for for a very long time. But that's for another video. Back to the 5155. The model F keyboard of this IBM 5155 was in really good shape. I will give it another cleaning just to make it actually spot on. This IBM 5155 also came with a hard drive, which my original one did not. So the, my original one only had two 360K floppy drives, while this one has a hard drive. Otherwise, the exterior is in pretty good shape. So I was pretty psyched about this. The back hinge of the case also seems to be working. There were no clippings that had broken off, so that was really nice. But there was some corrosion and rust on the back side of the case here near the expansion cards and the pc was also advertised as non-working so i would probably have my work cut out for it in order to fix it so i first wanted to open her up to see what was inside and what the condition of the main board and the expansion cards were because this is not something you want to see on your pc but I hit my first snag while attempting to open the case. I was able to open the three top screws here at the front of the case, but as I moved down to the lower screws here, I noticed that they were completely rusted. I was unable to open them using a screwdriver, and as such, I was unable to open the case. So something at the bottom of the case here has gotten pretty corroded. There was lots of rust here. So I don't know if something was spilled on it or if something leaked on it. Um, but I had to resort to some um, pretty harsh measures in order to get the screws out. So I used my uh, drill here to basically just drill the screws out of the case i knew that this would probably damage the case somewhat but i had to uh, see what was inside so i had to yeah basically had to do this but in the end i was able to drill out the screws and open up the case to see what is inside and at first glance everything seemed to be picture perfect it looked pretty clean as far as I could tell from here see there is a lot of shielding going on here to protect the main board expansion cards and also the display and as I was inspecting the inside of the case I also noticed here at the bottom that there was a lot of corrosion a lot of rust especially there where I had to uh, drill out the screws so I think something must have gotten in there somehow that, that caused this. Uh, it's only on the, uh, it's primarily on the bottom side. So yeah, hopefully it didn't affect the internals of the machine and it is limited to this chassis part only. Now let's first get this shielding off here. Now this IBM 5155 has a lot of screws and a lot of different screws in different places. So even to get as simple as this shielding off, you need to remove quite a lot of screws in some hard to find locations. I'll also remove this keyboard connector, which routes a keyboard connection on the front of the case. And then we can open up the chassis. So we have the five and a quarter inch floppy drive we have some cables going into an MFM controller for the hard drive. We have the floppy drive controller. We have some kind of memory expansion card and the video card here. So let me first get some uh, cables out of the way coming from the 360 kilobyte floppy drive and also the hard drive so that we can get a better view on the main board. 
And with the cables out of the way, we see the AMD 8088 CPU. And we also see that the motherboard is squeaky clean. Uh, there's obviously no corrosion on the main board itself. So let's take a look at the various expansion cards that we have here to see in what condition they are in. Here we have a parallel port in a bracket coming from this large yeah, memory expansion card here that probably also serves as a real-time clock and offers some I.O. ports. Here we also have a game port which is attached to the same card. Next up is this hard drive controller card which is not an MFM controller card but an RLL controller card from Seagate the ST11R and that's a really good thing because this is one of the very few controller cards that I know of that is able to uh, format RLL drives using 31 sectors per track 26 being the default one. I actually have a hard drive that uh, needs this controller in order to format it to its full capacity so yeah, that's a really lucky find here. Next up is the floppy drive controller so this is the original IBM floppy drive controller as can also be found in the IBM PC and the IBM PC XT it also has an external connector for external hard drives. And next up we have this big card here which acts as not only a memory expansion card but also has the parallel and the gain port that we saw. It also has this Varta battery which obviously has leaked and has probably or most likely damaged some traces here. This is a 25-pin serial port, so this card will probably need some attention. And finally, we have the CGA card, which uses this 4-pin header and cable on the CGA card to hook it up to the RF modulator of the screen inside the IBM 5155. So we're just going to be removing the CGA card. And here we have it, the original IBM CGA graphics adapter. So again, I was amazed on how clean the main board actually is. There is no corrosion to be seen. It looks like it just left the factory, to be honest. So I'm very hopeful that we will get this up and running again. And here's the overview of the cards. We have the IBM CGA card, the IBM floppy drive adapter, a memory expansion card, the quad board, which also features a parallel serial port and game port, and the Seagate ST11R RLL hard drive controller. And just to give you an idea on the different screws that are on this machine, in this single shot you can see four different screws next to each other. So we'll also need various tools in order to unscrew these screws here because I want to take a look inside the power supply just to see what the overall condition of the power supply is before I attempt to turn it on. Now to get into the internals of the power supply you need to open up a lot of screws. So you have two on the top, you have two on the rear. There are also four screws at the bottom that you'll need to unscrew in order to slide out the power supply. And there's also an additional one here on the top that hooks up to the ISA slots. And there are two here where the fan is located on the back side of the power supply. And with all of these screws removed, we can slide out the top frame to the right. And it can gently be put aside, taking into account that there is a cable running from the power supply to the internals of the 5155. Now the inside of the power supply looks really nice. I don't see any bulged or leaking capacitors, so that's already good. There is a fuse here on the side which hasn't blown yet, so that's also a good sign. So I think it's probably safe to put some load on the power supply and see if we can turn it on. Now before we start testing the power supply, I want to disconnect all of the peripherals. Uh, that includes the floppy drive, the hard drive, and the main board itself. Now these types of power supplies won't switch on if there isn't any load connected to it. 
and you need to have a sufficient load connected to it. So I'm just going to try and start it using this old MFM hard drive. So this is the only thing that I will be connecting to the power supply just to see if it will switch on. And let's see, it doesn't. So you can hear the hard drive clicking, but it immediately shuts down again. So I'm just going to be adding uh, my test hard drive as well as the internal hard drive, which was in the IBM. And now the power supply kicks in and starts. So I'm just going to see here on the AT connector to check for the voltages. So here we have a clean 5.2 volts. We have 12.1 volts and minus 12 volts. So the power supply seems to be good. Now, before we attach the main board to the power supply, it's always a good idea to test if there aren't any shorts on the main board itself. So for that, we're gonna be using the AT power supply connector. And notice here that there is indeed a short on the minus 12 volt line. As a result, when we try to switch on the computer with the main board connected, it will refuse to start. Now, if we disconnect this power connector that contains the minus 12 volt, we can see that the power supply does in fact kick in. So there is a short on the minus 12 volts, and that is something that we'll need to tackle right now. Now on these old IBM computers, the 12 volt line and the minus 12 volt lines are very error prone because there are tantalum capacitors on these power lines that are known to fail, explode, short circuit or go open circuit. So in our case, the problem was on the minus 12 volt line and this is the capacitor right here next to the power supply. So for now, I'm just gonna be removing the capacitor because it's not required in order for the board to function. In fact, all of the expansion cards that we are going to be using here don't require the minus 12 volt line. So let's turn on the computer right now and see what it does. So we hear one long beep followed by two short beeps, indicating a problem with the video card, which makes sense because we haven't inserted the video card just yet. And the reason we haven't done so is because there is an issue with the video card. I have a replacement video card here and let me show you what's wrong with the video card that came with this computer. I'm going to be using the ISA slot to do some measurements on the video card. The ISA slot is a standardized slot so every pin on the ISA uh, slot is clearly defined so we can find the voltage rails like the plus 5 volts, plus 12 volts and minus 12 volts very easily on this connector. So let's take our probes, put it into continuity mode and see if we can find the short. So we'll start on the left, which is pin number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the short just happens to be on pin number nine, which is the 12 volt rail. See here, I'm comparing it with the working IBM card and there are obviously there is no short on pin number nine. So we have found our issue. Now, pin number nine points to a capacitor here on the top, which is responsible for the 12 volt rail. So most likely the capacitor on the faulty CGA card will need to be replaced. So the fact that you have easy access to the ISA pinout on these expansion cards makes it very easy to check for shorts, to check if the various voltages are okay, and to find out what components are causing issues. But as I don't have any spare capacitors right now, I'm just going to do a shortcut and install the replacement CGA card that I know that works so that we can see if our IBM 5155 will indeed boot now and show something on the screen. So we're just gonna be inserting this full length CGA card into the IBM 5155. And we'll also need to hook up this little cable here onto the four pin connector of the CGA card in order to get the display routed onto the onboard screen. I'm going to be adding a piece of paper here because the last thing I need now are any more shorts. So with a bare minimum installed to get the computer to display something, let's start her up and see what she does. 
and we are in fact seeing a memory count here which is excellent news so that means that the main board is functioning we have the cga card up and running it will probably give some errors now because we don't have a floppy drive or a hard drive installed but it should boot right into basic so here we're getting error 601 which is the floppy drive error but upon hitting f1 we are entering the basic screen so i would definitely call this a small victory given the condition the computer was in when we got it but there is going to be a follow-up video here because we still need to test the hard drive and i can already tell you that this is not going to be a walk in the park we also need to check the floppy drive because that is also not working we still need to fix our cga card with the faulty capacitor and the computer could also do with a little cleaning and we'll of course need to fix this little issue here so we still have a long way to go before this machine will be ready for prime time but i hope you've enjoyed part one of this video and if you did please consider subscribing liking or commenting on the videos and i hope to see you soon bye bye